You better marry somebody of your own kind and stick with your own. That's what we were told. Find out if it's true next. All right, everybody, welcome Wednesday night at Anthony Drive, ADBC, Ezra chapter 9. We're supposed to probably be in Ezra 8. We sort of skipped over it because if you go back and you kind of watch the Facebook Live post from Sunday, Sunday we kind of we married Ezra 8 and Matthew 6 together, so uh, there wasn't a whole lot more to dig out in that chapter. Um, and this one, man, this one is, is, is prevalent for what's going on in our world today. Ezra chapter 9, the heading over my Bible says, Ezra prays about intermarriage. Ezra prays over the marriage or about the marriages of God's chosen people, the Jews, to the surrounding neighboring people that he finds them married to when he comes back to Jerusalem. And so we're going to read just little snippets in on this. And, and, and the very first verse really gives us a good jump on the idea of the entire chapter. It says, after these things had been done, so these things being Ezra has brought in to the temple treasury, he's brought all of these uh, riches from Persia that, that King Artaxerxes has allowed him. He's weighed them out. He's blessed the temple. He's blessed the people. And it says, after these things have been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priest and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Good job on the Egyptians for not being ites there. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with people of the land. And in this faithlessness... The hand of the officials and the chief men has been foremost. Ezra says, as soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and I pulled hair from my head and my beard and I sat appalled. What a great word in the Old Testament. And then all who trembled at the word of God of Israel because of the faithfulness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice at 3 p.m., I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn, and I fell on my knees and spread my hands to the Lord my God. And there's this beautiful prayer that Ezra prays to God where he just basically says, God, we're sinners. And God, we failed. God, you gave us a remnant. You allowed us. You were gracious enough to allow us to come back here. You, were, you have been such a good God to us, and we failed you. Now, let's back up just a minute. If you heard the teaser... Growing up in the South, there was this phrase that always sort of stuck in my mind. And it wasn't just white families that I heard say it. It, 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 was, it, it was this multiracial, multicultural, like agreed upon sort of thing in, in a lot of the South was you stick with your own. You, you don't marry outside of your race. You don't marry outside of your culture. You don't, I mean, you know, I would almost rather you bring home this horrible, horrible, you know, no goals, no ambition white girl than to bring home this amazing, rock-solid, Christian, educated black woman. And that's not from my dad. Honestly, I don't know that I ever heard that from my dad. Um, I feel like my parents, to give them a shout out, did a fairly decent job of raising us not to see race. But, man, you just heard it. And I've heard it in the church. I've heard it from leadership in the church that my daughter better not. She better not ever. And it's real easy, man, when you read this. They have taken their daughters to be wives for themselves and their son, and the holy race has mixed itself with the people of the land. Let me just go off script for just a second. 
Let's talk just a minute with everything going on. White people, you are not the holy race. Jesus, Jesus wasn't white. Moses wasn't white. Like, nobody in the Bible was white. None of them were Caucasian. So to say you better not mess up God's chosen people is stupidity. It's ignorance. On the other hand, we have to be very careful not to pander, I guess would be the right word, to pander to any group of people and in doing so lose sight of who we are in Christ. And let me let me throw this out here. There are a lot of people who are mad because we need to talk culture if we're going to talk intermarriage. There are a lot of folks right now who are mad because NASCAR has banned all Confederate flags. Right? Like, that's a thing. Like, people are, like, outraged about it. They're not going to allow us to fly the Confederate flag anymore. Um, man... It's a sport where a bunch of guys get in cars and they drive. Like, not to be mean, what are they famous for anyway? They're not heroes. They're just dudes that drive cars. But we've put so much stock in that. We've put so much stock in our quote-unquote culture that any sort of change for us We shouldn't have to do that. Like, we should be able to do what makes us comfortable. Now, let's flip this around. The agreement here could be made, right? Okay, so NASCAR is going to get rid of Confederate flags. And I'm going to look and say, hey, all of my white friends that fly the Confederate flag, you need to get rid of the flag. You need to take it down, right? You lost. We lost. Take the flag down. On the flip side of that, the agreement could be said, okay, since that's something derogatory from that time frame, nobody gets to say the N-word because that's derogatory from that time frame. So nobody flies the flag. Nobody uses the word. Nobody. White, black, Mexican. Nobody gets to say the word. Nobody gets to fly the flag. Now everybody on the other end is offensive, right? They're on the defensive. Like, hey, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me this. You can't tell me that. And we live in this world where I want to do whatever's going to make me happy. And I'm not really worried about consequence, and I'm not really worried about anything. I just want to do what makes me happy. You're going to see Ezra rip his clothes. You're going to see the man of God on his knees laid out before God because of their sin. The sin, we have to understand this, the sin was not that people with a little less melanin married people with a little more melanin. That was not the mixing that he was appalled at. It was not the color of skin. Look at what he says. The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land with their abominations. With their abominations. Now, if he just said they haven't separated themselves from the people of the land, all these people, and he lists out all these people, and he goes, man, they're mixing with these people. Now you have this racial cultural issue. But he's looking going, the problem is... All of these abominations, all of these things that these cultures, that these people have grown up to worship and to idolize have been brought into God's holy people. And at some point, God's people have kind of put God on the back shelf as they've worried about 
making right all of these things to appease all of these cultures, right? God is the one true God. Unless I marry a Hittite woman, then all of a sudden she brings her God in and she brings her beliefs in. Well, now my God and her God, they got to be even, right? They got to be equal. Because her family means just as much to me as my family does and yada, yada, yada. And that's where Ezra looks and he goes, man, this is the abomination. This is the problem. And I've said this over the past three or four weeks on these Wednesday night Bible studies. And you're going to hear me say it the next three or four until we can get this mess sorted out. And I know my little bit of scope. I know there's very few people watching these videos when you talk about a worldwide thing going on. But guys, listen. The problem is you are allowing the abominations of culture to dictate who you are in Christ. Right? You've allowed things that your father told you were important to become more important than sharing the gospel. I don't care if they take down statues to Robert E. Lee. I didn't know Robert. I didn't know if he was a good guy. He didn't owe me any money. I, I, you know, does it change history? No. Will I forget who won and who lost? No. And I'll tell my kids, you know, at one time there was a war in this country. And the North won. And that's it. That's what they need to know. What I hope my kids get way more from me than my southern heritage or my white heritage or bald man heritage, or any of that stuff, like, I hope that my children don't identify me as a great white man or a great southern man or any of those things. I hope they identify me as a great, godly, Christian man. If they look at me and see anything else, I have failed. If you look at me and you see anything else, I am failing. Right? If you, if you listen to this and you go, man, you know, he preaches good for a white guy. That's a fail. He preaches good for a young guy. That's a fail, you know. I, he kind of sounds hickish with his southern act. Like, that's a fail. I know I sound hickish. We have to get where we're looking at everything through the lens of this Christian worldview and what is appalling to God and what is not. And guys... Nothing in this chapter, and we have to start on this with the temperature of the world today, nothing in this chapter is pointing at interracial marriage and saying interracial marriage is wrong. Nothing. Intermarriage of God's people to people who do not observe God as God, that is wrong. I am much more offended that we have two white people or two black people in our church who are shacking up together before they get married, I'm way more offended at that than a white man and a black woman who are committed to God and committed to holiness and committed to purity and they get married and their marriage starts off on a godly foot. Like we are mad about the wrong things. And you're passing that down to your children and your children's children. And the reason everybody's mad now is because we're seeing each other on surface level. You've been taught that your black life matters. And it does. Overwhelmingly, it does to Jesus Christ. But if I say that my white life matters, now all of a sudden I'm racist and that's offensive. Blue lives matter. Oh, that, that's just wrong. Right? Guys, we got to stop seeing each other at this surface level. If my daughter brings home a young man, I, I, I can't look at him and think, my gosh, she's brought home a Mexican kid or she's brought home a Chinese kid or she's brought home whatever, right? I'm not going to look at the kid and go, oh my gosh, she's brought home a kid with glasses. Oh, look at his buck. And whatever it is, like I'm not going to judge that kid based on that appearance. How does he treat my daughter? 
What are his ambitions and his goals in life? How does he love the Lord? If the kid's a loser, he's a loser no matter what he looks like. If he's a winner, he is a winner no matter what he looks like. And if he is going to raise grandkids in a godly house and he's going to treat my daughter like the child of God that she is, man, how can I fight on that? And how stupid and ignorant of me to try to fight that. Let's run through this, man, real fast. Y'all gonna get me worked up. Y'all ain't even here. Ezra's issue with intermarriage of the people was based on sin. Let's talk about Christian marriages. Christians, I want to talk to you just for a minute. Because if we're going to talk about why he's ripping his clothes, you got to understand why he's upset. you got to understand why your pastor looks at you with the side eye a little bit. You guys in this relationship inside of the church. Christian marriage, number one, has to be, has to be centered on God. Has to be. The fact that the majority of weddings that I go to, that I officiate, that I attend, whatever, man, they're more centered on the kegger that happens 30 minutes after the ceremony. Let's hurry up and get through the ceremony. The ice is melting in the trash can. Like, we, when you stand there, do you understand what's happening? When you stand there, bride on my right, groom on my left, and we are talking, and you are making this vow and this affirmation to each other that you are promising not only that other person, you are promising God Almighty That your marriage is going to go forward and you're going to give it everything you got. And if it's centered on you or if it's centered on the other person, that marriage is destined for failure because they're going to change. You're going to change. But if we center our marriage on Christ, Christ is unchanging. In a relationship with an unbeliever, Right? You have a Christian and an unbeliever, and they're going to get married. Man, that is a, that's a hard road, man. That's a hard road. You come into this going, you know what? This is a great ministry opportunity. Like, I'm going to preach the gospel to them. They're going to change. I'm going to change them. And it's true, man. God can change your spouse. God can do it. Like, I'm living proof of that. My wife came to me and was like, I, there's three things. And some of you know this, some of you don't. When we started dating, she goes, there's three things you got to do if we're going to be together. And I was like, shoot. And she said, you got to get off of drugs. you got to stop cussing. And you got to go to church. And I was like, cool, whatever. She was cute, right? And God took this, man, honestly, this loser kid with no ambition, no drive, no idea what he was going to do with his life. And he saddled me up and he set me on a course. And man, I, events in my life that happened where he changed me, like it can happen, guys, it can happen. But see, my wife did all of this work before we said I do. Before the vows were vowed. Before anything happened. If you're going to be with me, this has to happen. So that by the time we married, I married my wife on the stage at the church doing youth ministry with her. Like it was a beautiful picture. So if you come into this going, I'm going to change them, you're already in a fail. You're already failing. Think about this. And some of you are in this mode, and I don't want to dump salt on the wound, but the thought hit me yesterday to struggle every day with the thought that your spouse, the person that you have handed your life over to, that you have dedicated your forever to, would continue to reject the gospel and miss out on eternity. That's a heavy heavy weight for a Christian to bear, that the person that I love more than anybody else is going to die and go to hell. Like, that's going to wear you out in your walk with Jesus. And you decided that back in the day, right? You decided that back in the day because they were hot. Oh, they're so cute. They're so, oh, they got so much money and they're so good to me. Whatever, man. 
If you take your faith seriously, can I really wake up every day, roll over and look at you in your face and think, man, you're dying and going to hell? That's heartbreaking. How can we center our marriage on Christ when one of us doesn't even know who Christ is? It's like trying to ride a tricycle with a lopsided wheel. I mean, if you think about it, Christ is that big center wheel. He's the driving force, and the two of you are supposed to be coming along, and all of a sudden, one of the wheels, the bolt comes loose, and it's just wobbling. You ever tried to ride a tricycle with a wobbly wheel? You go in a circle, and a bunch of you feel like you're going in circles in life because you stood there, and you committed your marriage to God, and God goes, y'all ain't committed to me. And so forever, we're wandering, we're circling. Christian marriage should be a ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. If you're not standing at that altar thinking of how we're going to do ministry and we're going to share the gospel with people, you need to reevaluate why you're standing there. As a Christian. Now, unbelievers, they go out and get married and have a good time. Christ developed marriage. He gave marriage. Two reasons. Number one, be fruitful and multiply. And all the people said, amen. And number two, to further the kingdom of God. A lot of people got number one down, man. Y'all busting out kids like nobody's business, but you ain't training them jokers up. You don't have prayer warriors. You don't have kind-hearted servants, man. You got mean little kids that look just like worldly kids. That can't happen. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. What partnership does light have with darkness? How can an unbeliever be yoked to a believer? How can we do ministry together? How can we be partners in the gospel if you don't even know the gospel? How can I pull and pull and pull and pull if you're back here being an anchor? We should look at our spouse as a person who helps the Lord to make us more holy. And the one person who helps stoke the fires of ministry and commitment to service. We are going to possess different gifts of the Spirit than our spouse. One of you may be a great teacher. One of you may be very silent. But you should both be on a like-minded mission to serve others and give the glory to the Lord. How can we expect to handle simple ministries, hospitality and serving and giving, when our unbelieving spouse is angry that those church people are coming over again or that our money keeps going to that stupid church. For marriage to be ministry, we have to be united with somebody who is just as eager to love the Lord as we are. Lastly, and I'm running short on time, but lastly, Christian marriages, listen to me, church. I don't care if I run out of time. We'll do a second video. Christian marriages have to look different than marriages in the unbelieving world. They have to. If your marriage dedicated and built on the foundation of Christ looks just like your friends who don't go to church and don't love the Lord and are not anxious to serve, that's a fail. That is a failure. This is the reason Ezra Messed his clothes up. The people had intermarried and over a short run of time, like 50 years, they had lost any look of God's chosen and set apart people. In the New Testament, we are called Christians. Those tiny Christ, those who are set apart, those who are something different. How can we do that? How can we be that if our marriage, one of the most important roles in our lives, looks just like those of the world? Divorce rates are just as high between Christians as they are unbelievers. Unmarried couples inside of the church who claim Christ but still aren't married. You're just shacking up and playing house. That mess shouldn't happen inside of the church. And I know you think I'm being super mean to you. But guys, if you are a member of the church, if you're a member of this church, and that stuff is going on, you two are going off on vacation together, and you're just hanging out, you know, and we're getting hotel rooms, and it's all good, and it's all fine. My heart aches. 
And I've never identified with anybody as much as I think I identified with Ezra in chapter 9. In chapter 10, where he turns around, man, and he just bawls to God. He just cries out to God. And he goes, God, I, I failed you. He actually uses the term, we, we have failed you. Ezra's not in any of these intermarriages. He hasn't done anything. But being God's man in charge of these people, he turns around and he goes, God, we have failed. You have been so good to us and we have failed you. If you love her, if she means that much to you, that you'll buy a house together, that you'll vacation together, that you'll have children together, Commit her to the Lord. If you are a Christian man by any means of the word, commit her to God. If you're not going to, cut her loose and let her go. Ezra chapter 10. Because right now you're just binding her up in sin. You are causing her to commit adultery. And your pastor, as Ezra, is appalled, and God is appalled, that we would come in Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and we would just play church, man, and just live in sin. Guys, there's a lot of you out there who don't take marriage near as seriously as you should. And I'm preaching to me, man. I was there. I'm not going to say, how dare you, and not say, how dare me. Like, there was some screw-ups on our end. We didn't start it off as holy as we should have. We sinned. Here's the difference, and I'm not trying to be self-righteous, not trying to be a jerk, man. We repented. We came to God with broken hearts. We came to each other with broken hearts, and we repented. It's time for that repentance. Christ came and he rocked the way the outside world saw the church, and vice versa. He committed to his bride with purity and strength and demanded demanded that she respond with the same. How does Ephesians say that we are to love? Husbands, you love your wives just as Christ loved the church, keeping her free from blemish. You see, somebody in this relationship has to be the one that makes sure things stay holy. That means when the hands go too far in a sinful situation, that person, as bad as it may hurt and as angry as they might get in that moment, must take a stand for Christ and the purity of this institution. If any if the other person can't handle this, or if they don't respond well, is this really the person you want to partner with in ministry? Two questions that we have to ask ourselves when it comes to a spouse. Number one, is this relationship sinful? Is it sinful? Not does it go against what we've been told about our culture and about our people. Is it sinful? We search scripture and we ask respected Christian leaders, if so, if it's a sinful relationship, end it. If not, the second question, does this person, I just knocked myself in the face, does this person push me to be a better Christian? Does this person push me to be more like Christ? Just as Ezra announced in chapter 9, verse 9. God has shown us great grace and allowed us this time to repent of our unclean ways and our idle relationships that bring harm to his name. Not that don't mean anything. You're actually harming the name of Christ. Next week, we'll take a look at what to do if you're already in a relationship. If I got married as an unbeliever, if we married as unbelievers and I came to Christ, how should I treat my unbelieving spouse? That's a whole different story. We'll look at that next week. But guys, today we have to understand Christ loves us and what he wants for our marriages, for our unions. Guys, we love you. If you have any questions, if you want to talk this out, feel free to reach out. My number's here. Feel free to reach out on Facebook. We love you. We love you. We love you. And I know it's been harsh, but guys, sometimes it's what needs to be said. We love you. We pray God blesses you richly in Christ. Guys, be blessed.